Um, so my name is Carrie Howard. I am a, a graduate of Texas A&M. Um, I did take some classes here at Galveston College and uh, I really enjoyed it. But I started out um, at a junior college up in the Dallas area. So I'm, junior colleges to me are an incredibly important stepping stone. Um, I was one of the first kids of six to go to college and it was because um, I didn't know what I was gonna do <laughs> and my parents had just a little bit of money saved that they encouraged me to get into junior college. I said, you know, your first several years you're gonna be taking very generic courses and those courses will open your eyes and open some doors to what is going on out there in the world and you may find what you are really excited about in that avenue. And so I did that and that's exactly what happened. Um, so I grew up through um, uh, in the Dallas area, went to a junior college. I was gonna be an art and marketing major, which would have not worked out very well for me. I'm, I don't have that cutthroat appeal. I'm more of a like, let's all play together. And so that competitiveness um, wouldn't have worked out. But I happened to take a biology class and they happened to have a Hawaiian field studies course. And I don't know that I was that wild about biology at the time, but I was pretty excited about going to Hawaii. But after taking a semester of weekend courses and then two weeks in Hawaii, I came back and announced to my parents, I'm gonna be a marine biologist. And my dad said, and poor for the rest of your life. And he's not wrong, <laughs> but I have had some amazing adventures through my career. So um, I'm glad to see so many young people because um, I'm gonna talk to you quite a bit about Galveston Bay and the Galveston Bay watershed. But I really like to share my story because I'm just a, a very ordinary person who has a lot of passion, who found um, my purpose in life, and that has actually propelled me um, very far, but it's been a combination of um, grasping at opportunities that were there, and then also doing some very deep digging to find the diamonds in the rough. So the short version, because I, only, I know I only have so much time, is um, I came out down here to go to school, and there were lots and lots of people like me, young, enthusiastic, passionate about ocean science, and going to school. And so once I got my degree, um, I started working in the private sector and that's where I did wetland consulting. Now I had already made a connection with plants because when I was um, going to school, I had to work full time to help pay my way through and you know pay for rent and food and all that stuff. Um, so I worked at the local plant nursery, Tom's Thumb, it's just right down the road from here. And so because I knew plants, I got into a wetland consulting job and mostly they were, I didn't know anything about permitting. I didn't know anything about engineering and construction and all those things, but I knew plants and they were like, well, what would you do if you found a plant you didn't know on the side of the road? And I'm like, well, I could key it out. And so they're like, okay, you can come work with us. So I did that for three years and I kind of knew about the environmental nonprofit kind of, you know, uh, education outreach, but I didn't know anybody. I didn't know how to get into that. I would apply to certain places and, they didn't know me, and so it was very challenging. And uh, a group of volunteers, now a lot of them are retired, but they're open to everyone. Um, and I had kept hearing about them called the Texas Master Naturalist. And so, um, but again, because they were at that time, this was 2010, geared for more retirees, I didn't have an opportunity to get in there, um, except I made a deal with, the, with, the, um, with my uh, supervisor at the time, and because we did some threatened endangered species studies, but really nobody knew very much about that. I said, well, if I could work four tens and then on Thursdays take the Master Naturalist training course, I will train all of our employees on how to look for threatened endangered species habitat for our permit writing. So she's like, okay. So I went through that. I didn't know what I was doing, but I was pretty certain I would meet people that would help me along the way. So I just went for it and took a risk. Finished the Master Naturalist program, uh, made the training, got some help with you know the materials and everything I needed, um, trained the coworkers, um, everything worked out great, and then I started volunteering. Now, at this time, I was a young mom. I'm working full time. I'm actually commuting to Houston, which is like 10 hours a week driving there and back. Um, but I made time on the weekend to volunteer a couple of hours, and what that started doing was that started connecting me with organizations the Nature Conservancy, Arm and Bayou Nature Center, all these different little places where I could go and help them out for a couple hours, even if it was a couple hours a month. They started seeing my face, 
I started remembering my name, and when those uh, job positions came on, boom, I was putting my uh, resume and my application in, and then some of the master naturalists that they, that they knew, and I was getting to know and developing relationships with, I was using them as references. So I went from working in the private sector, making decent money, but doing the slog, doing the Monday through Friday, eight to five, I, I like the field work of the job, but I hate the permit writing and it's paying the bills, to um, working at Artist Boat. Now there, I was the Habitat and Stewardship Coordinator. So again, I came in knowing some plants. I did wetland consulting, learn more plants. And then I got to help restore dune habitat after Hurricane Ike. And that really got me into working with the public and having community events. And what we did was we grew plants with school children. And then we took those plants and planted them on the dunes. So they got a beach field trip experience, but we planted 27 acres. And that was Galveston and Follett's Island that we worked. And so um, doing those community events and then working with Artist Boat and loving it, I found another opportunity with um, National Audubon Society. Now again, I didn't know very much about birds. I had taken one birding class in A&M that did not make me an ornithologist. However, I knew about plants and I knew how to do community events. Those are the only two things. So when the application came out, I filled out and embell you know, and I want to say embellished but I enhanced and made it look really good. I showcased what I was good at and told them I was willing to learn. And then they scooped me up. So I worked for National Audubon Society for six years. I had to learn a bunch of bird stuff, but we were restoring bird habitat uh, where they were nesting, which is critical habitat uh, for those birds. And then of course we were doing community events, but the big thing was community science. And that is training the public to collect data that we would then use to make management decisions. So I did that for six years, and then I get approached by Dr. Christopher Marshall over at Texas A&M, and he's like, I want you to come and do the same thing you did with the birds, but we're gonna do it with sea turtles. And by the way, we're gonna rescue and try to rehabilitate them. And then also, you're gonna be in charge of mortality studies. And I'm like, oh, awesome, what's, what's involved with mortality studies? Necropsies okay, I'm willing to learn, you know, it's like, I don't know very much about sea turtles. I took one sea turtle class. It didn't matter. The biggest reasons that they pulled me in was I had a couple of skills that I brought to the table that they didn't have. And I showed them that I was willing to learn whatever it took to do the job. So I hope that that message carries through to some of you that are feeling a little intimidated about getting into the environmental field. Yes, it is very competitive, but a good attitude and a willingness to learn and taking risks will take you a lot farther because a lot of people are just phoning it in. They're just trying to figure it out. You know, they're just only, risk taking is difficult, but if you put yourself out there, it will pay off in dividends. So while I can say that I have never made six figures, I have had the most amazing career working with endangered bird species and their nesting habitat, uh, saving sea turtles, and then currently, where I'm going to begin my presentation finally now, is working with the Galveston Bay Estuary Program. Now the Galveston Bay Estuary Program is a, um, it's state and it's federal. Now we work through, um, we work with TCQ, so that's like our parent program, but we're also very closely governed. Let's see if I could just not mess the thing. Oh, I did. I messed it up. See how fun that is? Oh, that's better. Um, but also we're heavily regulated by the EPA. So we get direction from them and money from them and we get direction from uh, the um, TCEQ. We're one of 28 estuary programs out there. And so um, all of the, most of the estuary programs are on the East Coast or the West Coast. Now our mission is very similar it's to protect our bay. And then um, how we go about protecting the bay can be very similar, but every bay system is different. The communities are different. The river systems that flow into those areas are different. And so we all have to go about an individualistic approach to preserve and protect those areas. And then we're also, this is very important. Um, we are a non-regulatory program. That means we do not write tickets. We do advise and we will take notes. Um, but we don't write any tickets and for me that's really good because I'm a very I'm very much a play nice in the sandbox with everyone kind of girl so um, Our specific mission is really simple Our goal is just to protect all of the natural resources within Galveston Bay so that 
generations to come can enjoy them. And, uh, and, and also for the, we have multiple bay uses. Um, so we want to enhance and improve that area and it can be challenging. So that's what a little bit of these connections I'm gonna make. Now, uh, how many of you know where our watersheds begins before I hit the next slide, which we'll tell you. Anyone wanna guess? Okay, uh, how many of you know where the Trinity River begins? Okay, anybody from, anybody from Dallas? <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. I, 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 Okay, so our watershed, which is essentially where all waters flow, streams, rivers, bayous, bays, um, actually begins just a few miles south of the Oklahoma border. So all of Dallas-Fort Worth and all of Houston is in our watershed. So occasionally we'll be in Dallas doing an event and say, hey Dallas, did you guys know you have a bay? And they're like, no, we don't have a bay. Yes, you do. And anything that you throw out your car that lands in the ditch, that goes down the stream, that goes into the river, that ends up in Galveston Bay. Um, what's really significant about this is about, and I, and I don't know, um, I know a lot has changed in the last year, especially Austin is really booming, Houston's booming too, population-wise, but we have nearly half the population of Texas in our watershed. That is an enormous, burden on our natural resources, but also a burden of responsibility to take care of these resources and because we depend on them. Where our focus is primarily um, within the lower half of the Galveston Bay watershed, um, we do work with like the Trinity River uh, Authority in the Dallas area. So we work with partners north of this area, but this is primarily where we're focused and particularly when we are funding projects, this is the area of focus, particularly because we have um, an enormous population, we have great communities here, we have tons of resources, and then of course this is downstream from all factors that impact the watershed. So this is typically where we get it. So one of the ways that we help protect Galveston Bay and the resources is through a comprehensive conservation and management plan. So this is, uh, if you think about a manual on how to go about protecting all of the different aspects of Galveston Bay and the natural resources. So we will coordinate with local agencies. We have what we call stakeholders. Those are people in the business, so they might be water authority, or they could be city governments, or they could be Texas Parks and Wildlife, or U.S. Fish and Wildlife, that are working on certain aspects of those um, components that make up our watershed, and then we're bringing them to the table, and they're helping us advise and construct the plan. They are part of our subcommittees, which I'll talk a little bit about, um, and then we also have a 41-member council. Each individual person on that council represents, um, a, is a stakeholder that represents a, a portion of our community. So it could be private business, it could be um, city government, it could be federal or state government, um, somebody that has kind of a stake in this claim that helps us with management, and then we also help with some of that advising as they're moving forward with their projects. So what we have done with the plan is essentially broken it up into four priorities, and this is kind of the skeleton of how we operate and how we interact with our stakeholders. So the first priority has a lot to do with water and sediment quality and safe human and aquatic life use. Um, and I'll go into these in more detail so I don't necessarily have to read them all off. Um, one of them is protecting our natural resources, so land-based, um, could also be shoreline or even water-based resources. Um, the one that I work directly for, and I say for as a service position, is engaging communities. That is my sole purpose as the um, public participation and ed education subcommittee coordinator. I, the state titles are really long, I think, to help us make us feel important. Um, and then, of course, monitoring and research, which is an incredibly important part of all of the components because we want to make science-informed decisions with everything we do. We're very passionate 
and there's a lot of emotion behind what we do, but we can't make decisions out of that emotion. It has to be science-based, so it's critical. Within the plan, we have some objectives, outcomes that we believe would help protect Galveston Bay. Um, these priority issues were identified by our stakeholders, and then we have recommendations for the outcomes, what we think will happen. These are action items that we believe if we're taken, they will help improve the areas. Um, also, implementation costs, what we think it would cost for it, and timeframes and outputs. So essentially, what we have been told is, these are the things that if we can work towards these goals, we will go a long way in helping preserve Galveston Bay and the natural resources that we rely on. So here I mentioned our council, an incredibly important part of um, think of them a little bit also, not only do they have investment into our programs, but they are also a checks and balance for us. So if we get very passionate going in a direction that's veering us from the plan, then our council will help redirect us, or vice versa. If there's something really passionate that we want to respond to, um, like let's just say something like a, a massive flood event, and we kind of all want to run in one direction, right? Um, we might say, okay, well, based on the plan, this is what we need to go and do. But the council would be there to help guide us as far as, well, from our perspective, this is what would be best for the community. Or if it's a federal state agency, they would say from this perspective, legally, these are the steps that we need to take to get that done. So it's an advisory committee, essentially. Um, but it's essentially important. And it really does help bring many, many voices to the table so that everybody has a chance to speak and um, consider all of the alternatives, not just going the direction of the loudest voice. So that's where we break into smaller groups with these subcommittees. And the subcommittees, um, I'm gonna go into a little bit more, the natural resource and use, uh, monitoring and research we have, um, public participation and education is one that I manage, and then um, they also have, um, Oh, I left one out. Um, water and sediment quality. Sorry, I do have it later on the slide. Um, and then, of course, the budget and priorities, the one that caught me off guard there. They are there essentially for the money. They help us decide, we're gonna spend this money in the, for these projects, and then, um, and of course, making sure that the projects that we spend the money are, are hitting the mark as far as the priorities that we wanna serve. So I didn't even get to tell you guys how much money we got to decide, let's see. Three weeks ago, we sat in a room with about 12 people and divvied out about $2 million worth of taxpayer funds, um, taxpayer dollars, to projects that we felt would serve our community and serve our natural resources best. So when my, I came home and my husband's like, what'd you do today? I spent $2 million with a couple of close uh, colleagues of mine and he's just like, yeah, that's for me. But uh, it's actually pretty exciting. So what all of the subcommittees do is we're always um, create this forum. It's, a, it's basically a place where people can come and talk about their expertise, sharing information, and coordinating and planning activities. And then we're also facilitating anything going on with agencies. We have commitments. We have action plans. We're making sure that that is getting done. We're making recommendations to the council, so if there are big things going on, let's say um, I mentioned before a massive flood event, water, quali uh, water and sediment quality subcommittees would be one of the first ones to say, hey, this is what we need to do, or this is what we recommend to start moving forward to do some mitigating acts or to help prevent this from happening in the future, that sort of thing. Um, we're also identifying the potential funding sources, and um, those are always available to all of our stakeholders. And then um, we're developing and recommending, like, if we need to change priorities, let's say some of our priorities have, are different uh, than they used to be, um, then we're kind of providing those updates. And then we're also reporting out on what's going on, what are, what are our partners doing, or, or what's coming up as issues in our community, and we're reporting that information out. And then um, I can get into the, what I want to do is introduce to you the subcommittees. And so a lot of this has been very targeted for 
you know, community or students uh, as I was sharing my story, but I'm hoping some of you that work for Galveston College, if there's projects that you guys have going on that might align with some of the work that the subcommittees are doing, this is your open invitation to start getting involved because this is completely open. All of our meetings are open to the public, of course, but um, if you're involved in any of these aspects, then you're a potential stakeholder that needs a seat at the table and particularly a voice um, because we want to know what's going on. So water and sediment quality a lot of their projects and their priorities and their action plans have to do with non-point source pollution and point source pollution now remember we don't do any regulation but we do work with the site of tcq that does that regulation so we can help with advisory um, we can help with like seafood safety awareness and recreational risks with water and safety um, for public health we can do uh, stormwater uh, education programs that kind of Educate people about, I mean, simple things like not clogging the drain right before hurricane season because we know um, what happens in that situation. Um, but some people don't. Um, water based, uh, watershed based plans. So this can be areas where the water quality that's been tested by state or federal agencies is really poor and we need to <laughs> mitigate it. And so here's a plan that, um, that the city governments can do to help improve that, but then there's also always things that the community can do to help improve that. So, so they work with those impairments. Um, and then of course, any agencies or organizations that are working on any aspects of the plan, they help as far as resources and guiding it. it I might get calls about, you know, hey, we're doing this and, and uh, it aligns with the plan, but we're not sure how to make that connection, or we're not sure who to talk to about that connection. We help connect those dots for them. So a couple of really great projects that we have funded um, one of them is, um, is really a hot topic um, with a lot of people, but also with a lot of uh, scientists that are working with endangered species. So when I was doing the sea turtle mortality studies, this was a big topic. It's the plastics. Um, and then particularly the microplastics, we don't necessarily see them. They're there in the water and they're impacting everything around us. Um, and so this was um, an organization that was essentially going into different parts of Galveston Bay. And not only were they collecting samples and quantifying those samples, but then they were categorizing the samples to see what types of plastics and where are these plastics coming from. Um, so that was a pretty exciting um, project. And it was, it was very fruitful to see that most of the plastics were coming from our run-of-the-mill litter. So it's plastic bags that are breaking down um, styrofoam, um, uh, con uh, plastic containers, just things like that, that we know are what we call single-use plastics um, that we could reduce uh, necessary, we can reduce them. Uh, we're looking more for a push on that, but um, a lot of organizations do that with us. So, And then um, the other project that I thought was really worth highlighting was um, an outreach implementation. Now this was a series of uh, education tools that were really given to very small communities that did not necessarily have a marketing plan or even marketing staff um, that they could use throughout the community to kind of help improve the areas, the storm drains, the water quality, um, or even just the aesthetics around the community. Um, so that was, that was actually pretty, um, a very successful program. Then we have natural resources uses this is all land-based, so a lot of these projects are um, conservation of habitat, so that could be restoration or enhancement. So some of the grants when I worked at Audubon I got from here, and that was to Im improve um, bird islands. So we got grants to plant on the bird islands and help protect the shorelines. Um, also land acquisition. So land use right now is just being gobbled up for development. But we really need wetlands, we really need estuaries to keep a functioning system in the ecosystem, particularly because um, we get billions of dollars from our fisheries in here. So if we're losing the estuaries, which are our nursery grounds for our, for our fish sources and shrimp sources and oyster, um, we're not going to have much left to you know, be taken care of. Um, so the conservation assistance program essentially provides dollars and match for organizations that are looking to buy land and just preserve it for wildlife and for generations to come. And so then once that conservation easement is put on there, no developer could come in, buy up that land and put a bunch of paved lots on it. 
which is really good. Artist Boat, um, Galveston Bay Foundation, and many, many other organizations have taken advantage of that. This subcommittee also works with um, threat endangered species and species conservation um, with regards to wildlife and monitoring. And then they also do quite a bit with um, native species management and then invasive species uh, control and eradication if they can get it. So a couple of cool projects I pulled, um, and you'll, I'll, I'll, put the, I'll put the dots together, but uh, this is what gets me excited. So Challenger 7 Memorial Park, that primarily was a grant that was um, for enhancement. It was, a, it was our existing park, it's a Houston um, Harris County Park, but uh, they just had um, Student Conservation Association crews come in and they got to learn how to do on-site work um, in conservation. And then, but that is actually a park anybody can come and visit, um, which is kind of amazing to see those natural areas. Um, another project that, um, that I got to help participate with, which was great, is this is the American Oyster Catcher, and it's an endangered species that um, really enjoys nesting here, but it loses habitat every year from sea level rise, subsidence, um, and then disturbance, a, a lot of it is. And so this was essentially a project that funded uh, protection of those nesting habitats. Then we come to my favorite. Just kidding, they're all my favorite, but this is really my favorite. Um, and it's because of my experience working with the community. When I was a young scientist working hard to save the planet, um, I just really wasn't getting very much done by myself. And so I feel very passionate about pulling in the community. Part of it is getting them excited and helping them see those connections. And so um, I know that this is why it's a good fit for me to be here now. Um, but what I focus on with my subcommittee is promoting stewardship activities and volunteer opportunities. Um, those were so incredibly essential for me when I was just uh, starting up. So it's giving opportunities to new young people coming up in the ranks um, that maybe they would not otherwise have. But it's also high level community involvement. So if there is a water protection plan that is going into an area and the residents are very confused about why all they have these restrictions, it's going in there and doing the education and workshop to help them understand that they're playing a part in conservation when they're taking these few small actions. Um, it's also working with adult and um, K through 12 education so that we're not waiting until people are already in their habits doing what they normally do and then trying to change those habits Anybody who's older than 25 knows it's very difficult to change habits um, once they're established. So, so getting them when they're young and excited and then utilizing that uh, energy to help change their parents' mind about behaviors and, uh, and getting more involved with, I would call it daily stewardship, bringing a, a reusable bag to the grocery store, something that small can have a big impact when we all do it together. So then some of the projects um, you guys actually may be a little bit familiar with. Um, uh, know Your Watershed was a program where we taught teachers about the Galveston Bay Watershed and all of those connections. We worked with Harris County Department of Education to make them STEM align. We helped them create STEM programming and lesson plans. And then once those teachers had the experience and the inherent knowledge, they took all of those lesson plans and uh, field experiences and exercises into the classroom. So it was a train the trainer really for teachers, um, but it had a very, very big impact, which was very important for us. And then um, the Galveston Seawall Recycling Project, we worked with the park board. And, um, and so what the park board's commitment was, was uh, we paid for the recycling containers. We worked with the artist boat to um, Kind of promote and let everybody know what was going on and then the park board of trustees would come and collect that recycling and they continue to do that process so if you're out and you see one that is one of our uh, fabulous projects we're very excited about it. and it continues and then the monitoring and research subcommittee and so this one is very specific with um, universities or research projects that may be going on. Now what's interesting is I don't have a very specific list of the things that they do. This is very general. And it's partly because the subcommittee for public participation and monitoring and research work together with land use and water resources to decide where do we need research the most 
And then as far as the messaging that goes out to the public, I rely on those other subcommittees to tell me what, what from the science do I need to translate so that not only the community understands the science, but then they know they have an action item, something that they can do and take away to be part of that solution. So in monitoring and research, we could get everything from, well, let me just talk about a couple of them. <laughs> um, regional monitoring database. Any of you students out there geeky about uh, data sets yet? Not yet, you will be, just wait, just wait until you find something you really love. Um, so there are agencies that monitor water quality. There are agencies that are monitoring seagrass communities. There are agencies out there that are looking at um, that bird, breeding bird surveys. And um, if you can think of it, they are monitoring it. And now we have a single portal where all of that information is going into. Um, and so I'll talk kind of specifically as I help make some more of these connections. Um, so that's one really great project we're super excited about. And then another one, um, this one was done out of A&M. It's the effects of erosion control structures. Um, anybody been kayaking out in Galveston Bay and seen these big black sock tubes and some of them are collapsing and yeah, those are the geotubes. And, and, and sometimes they work and a lot of times they fail. But uh, a lot of these projects, the research are, okay, we invested all this money to make this work. Is it actually working? And we don't know, that's what science is all about. It's going in and discovering it. So some of those projects are just looking at, like this one in particular, looking at vegetation and the soil characteristics and the epifauna and just see, is this actually working and functioning like it should be, like a natural system that wasn't impacted by our dredging activities or other, you know, or natural storms too can definitely have an impact. So for some of you that have always been here, when you go to different, um, and I say when, because you should always try to travel when you can. When you go to a different bay system, it can be very different as far as feeling your connection to the bay. Now you guys are here on the island, but if I go give this presentation to someone in Houston, they're not gonna feel that connected to Galveston Bay. If we were in San Francisco, we could pick five random places on the map, stand there, and know there's a bay right there because of that topography, we could see it. We're very flat here. We're very fortunate to be in the Great Plains, um, but that means that we don't necessarily see the water if we're standing downtown Houston, unless we're right next to Buffalo Bayou. So that is a big challenge for us, is to help people feel connected to the bay because the bay impacts them and what they do impacts the bay. So that's where um, I'm going to lead us down, how they fit together. And this is why you're more connected than you realize. So I just picked four random projects. Some of them I introduced them to you already. Um, and you'll see as I guide you through this process. So the bottom corner picture here with the teachers that are kayaking. The influence that we had on those teachers was teaching them about their watershed. But what are they doing? They're not frowning. It's not a teacher in service for sure. Um, they're enjoying, that's recreation. So they are making that connection with that natural place that they're kayaking in. And they know they only drove 15 or 20 minutes to get to that spot. So they can certainly come back and kayak again. Um, the water quality project that we had that was simple steps to reduce litter will have an impact. As those teachers were out there kayaking, they may or may not have seen trash, but I bet you if they saw a Sonic cup or a water burger cup, they knew exactly where that came from. And so that messaging absolutely did get worked into the lesson plans that they taught the students. So then that, so then that box gets checked, right? The um, Challenger 7 Park. So now we're teaching the students about our natural resources in Galveston Bay. The teachers are talking about how much fun they had kayaking, how beautiful it was, and the birds that they saw. They're talking about how much we need to preserve it by uh, recycling. And the kids go home to their parents and say, I want to check out this park. So the enhancements that natural resources did to make a park not just accessible, but more natural, now the kids are bringing their parents or their family out to the park so that they're enjoying more of Galveston Bay resources. And then um, when the science park comes in, what we're looking at is this is one of the uh, monitoring portals that we have. This is the, what they call the EJ screen, this is from EPA. 
This is the social vulnerability index. Now, just as this is a snapshot, this is the whole site, so we're not gonna go down this rabbit hole because I don't have that much time. But if you see those very, very dark colored squares, those are portions of the city that are most vulnerable to the negative impacts of pollution, poor water quality, they do not have access to uh, recreation, outdoor, natural spaces. So those tend to be the areas that we want to take these teacher programs into those inner city schools, give the teachers those experiences, help those teachers find parks, and work with the parks in those systems to help enhance that so that those families have access because they're the ones that are getting the most pollution, they're in the you know, the poorest communities, they have the least access and they have the least knowledge. So that is how, that's just one example of how these all fit together. Here's another one. Oh, that, there's my extra one. Um, and so the recreation part, that's the part I love the best actually, is the, that connection. Okay, so here's another uh, series of projects, okay? Microplastics, I kind of mentioned sea turtles. It was a huge issue finding plastics in their, um, in their GI tract. Um, but also with the oyster catchers. And we're enhancing their islands for nesting, but then they're dying from eating plastics. So what are we gonna do about that? The data analysis that's being done is actually categorizing where is that plastic coming from? And so getting that classified and analyzed and then translated, I have to say that a lot for scientists, we have to translate this for the community. They don't speak PhD. Um, and they don't need to, we need to translate it for them um, to help understand that impact. Significantly, what we're finding is the new research, and I can't show you pictures because they're not done with the project yet, but I'm allowed to share with, about it. Um, they are taking cross sections of Red Drum. Who is the one that asked about hearing about Red Drum? Are you ready to hear about Red Drum? Sure. All right, so they're taking, uh, uh, sand trout, red drum, and other fishes that we typically catch and ingest, they're taking the tissue, just the meat tissue that we would normally cook up and fry up and eat, and they're analyzing and finding microplastics. What they are finding is that micro, the plastics are not going away at all. They're just breaking down smaller, smaller, and smaller, smaller. And then through bioaccumulation, which is a small fish eats it thinking it's an egg, and then a bigger fish eats that fish, and a bigger fish, and then it gets to us, and then we're eating all that fish. Um, it's bioaccumulating in our bodies. Now, I don't know who science-wise is looking at our body tissues, but we know that the red drum and the sea trout and um, all of those, that's a really heavy impact on our health. So um, those are things that we need to consider. This is why this messaging is so important. So again, going to public participation, and now no one's gonna wanna go eat fish. It's probably okay, but you know, just be aware um, that it's happening, and then um, sharing that information. Not to scare you, but to make you aware. You can't make informed decisions if you don't have the information. So that's part of our job. And then of course, um, how the recycling messaging can help benefit our wildlife and our species. So that I think that's what that area is for. Okay, so I, now I have to share something really incredible story because I um, scared you off with all the with all the microplastics in the fish. But uh, this is a really incredible project. And what's funny is I was here volunteering with Master Naturalist before I really knew what it was. Um, this is this Exploration Green. It's kind of up there in the Clear Lake area. However. Um, it used to be a golf course, and it was an abandoned golf course forever, and nobody used it. It was just a big green piece of land. I'm sure some wildlife was using it. Um, what that area needed, <laughs> very, very desperately, was a detention pond. But we've all seen the detention ponds with the riprap shoreline, and there's really, wildlife can't use it um, because there's no gradient. There's not really great vegetation um, that serves as habitat. So. So what they did was they worked with Galveston Bay Foundation, the county, the city was involved, and then of course Master Naturalists and other organizations, and they designed essentially a habitat. Now they had this, they had phase, I think two and three completed before Harvey. And what the engineers calculated from holding, let me see if it says it up there, how much, how much water? 500 million gallons of stormwater 
from Harvey that held. That's essentially like four to six foot of water that wasn't in those houses. This is an incredible project that shows when we are engineering with natural resources as our primary purpose to focus on, wildlife habitat, water retention, um, and water quality improvements because water gets filtered through those wetlands. Nature does that job for us. If we will build it, it will function properly the way it's supposed to. Um, but it benefits us to have these spaces, but not just physically, mentally and emotionally. If you're working in Houston and you're on the freeway and you're in the traffic and you have a rough day, taking your dog for a walk at a place like this, looking at the birds and the dragonflies that are flying around, those things benefit us. We, well, I'm gonna get off the soapbox, but it's really important. So that's what, I'm, that's what I wanted to share with you um, and an incredible place that you could actually go visit. So because some of this was uh, an invitation to come talk about the state of the Bay or the state of the world, but I'm just mainly talking about the Bay, I would be amiss to not share a little bit of information on resiliency. Now in the um, state you know, world, we're not allowed to use the C word, you know, climate change. It's not really uh, what they want us to use, but we're allowed to use resiliency in this. So um, I wanna just talk about the impacts of two major events that happened this summer and the spinoff effect on those. And then one I'm just gonna throw out because I'm totally geeking out on it, but it's also a little doomsday. So we won't go too far down the rabbit hole because you wanna sleep at night, um, but you won't need a horror movie to watch before bed, I promise you. So warmer summers, what happens if we get warmer and warmer summers? So the resilience assessment that we created um, with HARC, our partners, and other stakeholders were very involved. We basically got in the room and said, okay, worst case scenario, what's going to happen? Uh, what impacts, uh, what different communities are going to be impacted? What habitats are going to be impacted? Wildlife, all of those things. And we just threw it up on the board and talked it through and decided, okay, high probabilities, but also high consequences. We had low, medium risk for everything. So I'm just giving you the little snapshot. This is the cliff notes. If we continue to have warmer summers, we're gonna have increased heat stress, and that's for humans, but also wildlife and plants. That is gonna increase our vibrio and other bacterial um, organisms in our water, so that's gonna be an issue for us. It's going to increase storm activity. You know, we just saw that happen, what, in the last 48 hours in Mexico? That, that, was, that is devastating for them, and that sure as heck would devastate us. To have a storm, go 110% increase in 24 hours. Are, are any of you familiar with what just happened in Mexico? Um, with a, well, just look up uh, Hurricane Otis. Yeah, it was, it was incredibly devastating. Um, and and, and um, I, I wouldn't wish that on anybody, but that's what's coming um, with some of our uh, resilient issues. Um, we will require more water for irrigation, but that will lead to more runoff. And essentially what happens with runoff is any pesticides and fertilizers that are sitting on the surface are gonna run off and then get into the water. So some of those fertilizers are gonna get more algae to bloom and that's gonna be an issue for us. Um, increased heat with the air temperatures and the soil temperatures are going to change the plant communities and the plant communities are what insects and birds and everything in the food web depends on um, and we'll have more tropical composition which might not be too bad. I mean, I like hibiscus and plumeria, but that's not native to our area. So, um, so it could be, uh, have a very negative impact. And then of course our oyster reefs, which um, we are the number two producer of oysters here in Texas. Number one is Louisiana. Now, most people think of like the Northeast area of being producers of oysters. And maybe at one time they were, but we're number two producer for oysters here. We're a very, very high productive um, bay, so it's very important when we talk about that. Plus, oysters help filter our water quality, so they are incredibly important to us, even if you don't like eating oysters. So then the other one we have this summer, increased drought. It's gonna slow the base flow from our river systems, which is going to decrease our water quality and just decrease our water in general um, and freshwater inflow. So our pollutant concentrations that we get from the street or from refineries or other issues that we have are going to increase. Our increase, uh, we will have increased need for water needs. 
And then of course, we will have a higher burden on our resources. Um, and then also the other parts um, that will impact us is we'll have increased salinity in areas that are brackish. And if you aren't familiar with brackish water, that's essentially where fresh water mixes with salt water and it's a very, very delicate balance. And that's essentially all of Galveston Bay and everything that depends on it, the shrimp, the fish communities, the oysters, um, and everything connected to that. And then of course, with increased drought, we can have more of our red and brown tides, which cause fish kills and can cause uh, bird kills and can actually cause asthmatic symptoms in a lot of people. Um, and then ocean acidification. This is essentially just the lowering of pH in the ocean. But the problem with this is that a lot of shellfish, corals, uh, clams, and of course clams and uh, other bivalves are, are filter feeders, so they're helping with our water quality. They require calcium carbonate to build strong shells. And if there's too much, if there's more acidity, they can't build that. So here's what's happening in um, the flower garden banks. They're having massive die off. And it's essentially like, think about a big structure, uh, like a city building, and then you're just blowing out the bottom floors. And um, the whole communities will collapse at that point. So we're really having to watch it. There's not a lot of information about ocean acidification um, with regards to Galveston Bay. And so that's one of the new projects. I don't know how many photos more because we're just starting to fund it, but we need to take a look at that impact. And if you're not familiar with this, um, essentially what it is, is this, the excess CO2 that we're pumping out into the environment is getting absorbed by our ocean. Now, I know when I was a kid, I always thought that the rainforest was keeping us you know, with breathable air. But as I got into marine science, I realized the rainforest is doing a great job, but who is keeping us alive? It's those, um, those the plankton in the water communities, those little microscopic plants they are doing all that job. So if, if they're, if they collapse, you know, there's not going to be any oxygen for us. We'll have big, big problems. Um, so all of these things are very, very important. There's nothing I can specifically do about it. Even if I was a researcher, all I could do is do the research and share that information. But each of us are playing a very significant part because we're all connected, just like an ecosystem is connected. We just do our part collectively. We can make a lot more progress. So if you're interested in that resiliency assessment, um, you'll go to our website, you'll go to the uh, Galveston Bay Council, and then uh, when you click on our projects for the 2023 meetings, um, it's down there in April 19th. And the reason I'm showing this to you is because the EPA haven't uh, given us a publication number for this report yet, so I don't have it on a main page, but you can definitely find it, or I have business cards and posters and stickers I want you to take. But uh, let me know if you're interested because essentially it covers the gamut on what our risk factors are um, as we are moving as we're moving into um, a, cha a massive changing climate. And then I want to touch on a little bit of resources, especially for you students. Let's just say if you're curious, because curiosity is going to take you a lot farther than pure willpower. <laughs> if you can just stay curious, my friends, then you your careers will really take um, and uh, take off in great directions. So on our resources page, we have our Back the Bay campaign, and those are easy things that you can do or, or organizations you can get connected with if you're interested in volunteering or just seeing what future jobs could be out there for you. Um, but then also completed projects we have where these are past projects that we've done. They're the final report, so it's the very best pictures and the very best of what they did, how it worked out, and what the end result was. And so you can go through any of those. Um, this is a little, uh, we're revamping the back of the bay, so uh, pretty soon it will be much better, but that's coming soon. Um, and then of course, um, our management plan, it's actually pretty ready, uh, ready and easy to read. Um, and I covered a little bit more on that. And then the, let's see if I have the monitoring database up there. Have two of the same slide. Okay, and then of course, why I always like to leave the people what you can do. Um, Back the Bay campaign has great stuff you can share on social media and tips and things you can do. Um, implementation plans if there's projects going on that you want to get involved in, all you do is get with us, we connect you with those people. Um, if there's local government that you want to be participating with, that's where a lot of decisions are being made. Now, I don't get to lobby for any of that because I work for a state employee, but sometimes that's where stuff gets done and you matter because you vote. 
Um, and then also, um, we will have a State Advance Symposium coming up in 2025. So if anyone was interested in volunteering at any of the outreach booths or presentations that I do, or if you're kind of interested in the science but you don't know how it works, poster sessions or people talking about the research, or if you just want to get involved with the businesses and organizations that come together at a symposium and kind of learn how to do the meet and greet and introduce yourself so you can kind of get your name out there, um, please consider volunteering. Volunteers, it's like $200 registration, but if you volunteer with me, it's 30 bucks. It's a two day session. Um, you get to kind of pick what uh, lectures you're gonna hear and the involvement. We feed you, which is great for college students. Um, and then you get those experiences and you'll make those connections with hopefully your future employers if you're interested in um, any kind of marine or environmental sciences. So, wow, 51, 54, that wasn't too bad. Um, are there any questions that anyone has? I have covered a whole lot today. So. I'm just going to take that as you guys are so interested in I did a good job. Okay, there's some questions. Yes, sir. Do oh, you guys have some kind of articulation with Texas or uh, Parks and Wildlife? Yes, we have a lot of involvement with Texas Parks and Wildlife. They are on our advisory committees for any, any project that has to do with um, resource management, land management, and, and threatened and endangered species. So if somebody's interested in doing some projects with Texas Parks and Wildlife, or how do you even get in for one of the um, internships, you know, it's, it's, it's a great organization and we can help you make that connection for sure. Uh, yes, sir, in the back. I, I wanted to ask a question, they're kind of the same, but um, uh -huh. with Artist Boat, I know Artist Boat does a lot. They do, yeah. Are y'all here at the Hall? We are. Um, we have given, I think $2.3 million over the last five years to help them with the land acquisition. Okay. So the, the Conservation Assistance Program, what we call it CAP, um, they have applied for that every year and they get money every year. Okay. So this last round of 2024 funds, um, we gave up, we were able to grant them, I didn't say give them like you know, it's a gift, but um, $600,000 towards Anchor Bay that they're currently right now trying to preserve. And then of course the GLO is throwing in a, a nice sweet $2.2 million to help them preserve Anchor Bay. So I don't know if that's all they need. I'm, I don't do their math, I barely do my own. But um, but yeah, absolutely, They're, they do great work on the island. And so we help fund with not only their land acquisition, but also a lot of their education programs too. Okay. So yes sir, in the back of the purple shirt. It's the same like, uh, the same thing that, that's affecting Um, and the plastics that, that like are in the, in, the, in the sea, you say fish are eating it, so yes. eating it too? Yes. Or anybody who eats seafood? Yes. So, you know, just kind of reiterate briefly. There's, yeah, there's a lot going on. So the similarities before between um, uh, deforestation going on in the rainforest, um, that is basically land use. So they're, they're clipping all that down so they can use it for uh, agriculture, right? Which they need. However, the trees are higher production as far as oxygen content than crops, and especially because crops are seasonal. Um, same thing in our area, only we're paving areas so that we can support our growing population in this area. Um, now, specifically to oxygen, that was what I was speaking to with the rainforest when I mentioned it, was that rainforest and all forests and all plants are high oxygen producers, and that's what we need to breathe. But the highest producer is actually the plankton right. in the waters. So they have found plastics in plankton. They have found, and then of course we know that fish eat plankton and then bigger fish eat those fish. So that's what they call bioaccumulation, where um, think about, um, well, let's just use me an example. So I have two kids, and then that means that I have twice as many opportunities for kids' birthday parties. So let's pretend I was a size eight before I had kids, and because uh, I wasn't. Um, but because I have accumulated more and more birthday cake over the years, I have uh, more and more cholesterol, right? 
So it essentially works the same way. The more that we ingest, the more our bodies hang into. Our bodies don't know how to process plastics. Um, so it kind of acts like a, um, it's an intruder, but it encapsulates it, and then it just stores it in fat somewhere, right? right? And so um, unless we're doing something with it, which we're just now aware of it as far as what we're gonna do with it, um, it just accumulates and accumulates. So anything larger that we're gonna eat, like sardines probably won't have very much plastic in them because they're pretty small. And they don't live very long. But something like tuna that lives a good amount of time and has been eating all that time, that's gonna have a lot more plastic in it. And that's typically the fish we want. Now we would never eat dolphin, but I'm sure dolphin has lots of plastic in it. So. And no way they ever find any chemicals to break it down. Our bodies will eventually try to break it down. Um, and that is a natural process that we see in everything in nature, but it takes time and you have to, st I have to stop putting birthday cake in my body. So I work out and I can eat carrots and celery, but I have to stop eating birthday cake if I want my body to be able to process all the cake I've eaten all those years. So if you remember when we had a um, COVID hit globally and everybody just kind of stayed indoors and we heard more stories from Europe where people just stopped traveling and they stayed home and suddenly air quality got better and water quality improved. And it was essentially because we stopped being human and doing all the things that we're doing to damage the planet. Nature was starting to correct itself. So there is actually a solution um, that it's gotta be something different than just staying home and not doing anything. But, um, but there is a solution and nature will heal itself. Our bodies will heal itself. But we have to stop overburdening it. And that's part of the messaging that we try to get out. Okay. Can I do the last question real yes, quick? Yes, sir. So you talked about you know, nature regenerating. Are there things we can do you know, within our yards that will you know, help? Yeah. Yes, there are several things. The Back the Bay website has all, uh, all listed. However, um, if you own your home, um, only do recommended fertilization. Don't over fertilize your lawn. It, think about vitamin C. You take a bunch of vitamin C, you pee it out, right? Nature's the same way. If you put too much on there, it's just gonna end up in a storm drain and then it's gonna turn into an algae bloom. Um, if you can reduce any single use plastic, just pick like a month where like plastic free July, you will save a significant amount of plastics that unfortunately do end up in our ocean. So bring a fork that you can wash. Um, I typically bring a reusable bag um, and I'm gonna be honest, I forget to bring my reusable bags in the grocery store. You know what? You will not get in trouble if you don't bag your groceries and you wait till you get to the car and bag them out there. And I don't recommend it in a rainstorm or the heat of summer, but um, they will also let you pay for your groceries, leave your cart, go get your bags and put them in. It takes a little bit for us to unlearn patterns, but there's a lot of stuff that we can do. Um, go to your city and county websites where they have watering recommendations, do those things. Bring a reusable water bottle instead of getting a plastic one. There's a ton of little things we can do. They will have a big impact if we all work together. Well, let me see. Thank you. We have a, uh, a little surprise gift for you. A little gift bag. Thank you. And, uh, and we would like to thank all of you to come. We'll have another uh, lecture in a few weeks. And so we'll hope to see you there. Thank you all. Thank you.